Welcome to the State of the Union from Brussels. The European Union's Autumn Summit, held this week in the Belgian capital, was attended by a new Prime Minister that is well-known face of the centre-left. Robert Fico is once again leading a government in Slovakia, but now on a much more populist and eurosceptic basis. A neighbour of Ukraine, his country will no longer support European efforts to arm Kyiv in its defence against Russia. This European summit was, so to speak, a war council. As I said, Ukraine is always on the agenda, but obviously a large part of the debate centered on the conflict between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. A total siege is not in line with the international law. Uh, many leaders address this topic of, uh, of the siege, but there is uh, one, one thing very clear. Uh, there is a, a serious deterioration of the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and that's why we think that the EU should do everything which is possible uh, in order to, to help resolve this uh, question of the humanitarian access. Before joining the summit, some EU leaders also took part in the second day of the so-called Global Gateway Forum. This is the bloc's infrastructure partnership plan to rival China's Belt and Road Initiative in areas like digital, climate and energy and health and education. The EU announced a series of new investment agreements with developing countries in Africa and Asia. The 300 billion euro plan, covering up to 2027, is also conceived as an instrument to expand the bloc's geopolitical influence in the world. The head of the European Commission presented the European Union as a better choice in development cooperation. Global Gateway is about giving choices to countries, better choices. Because for many countries around the world, Investment options are not only limited, but they all come with a lot of small print and sometimes with a very high price. Sometimes it is the environment that pays the price. Sometimes it is workers who are stripped of their rights. Sometimes foreign workers are brought in. And sometimes national sovereignty is compromised. One of the countries that signed the new partnership was Bangladesh, worth almost 400 million euros. It is a country of 170 million inhabitants that, in 50 years of independence, went from being one of the poorest in the world to being on the verge of obtaining the United Nations classification as a middle-income nation. Bangladesh has been a partner in the Chinese initiative for a few years and does not intend to abandon it. But there is still a lot to do, and the Prime Minister told me in an interview on Wednesday that Europe's help is one of many. I think it is a big opportunity, uh, as because we just uh, selected and we graduated from LDC to uh, developing country, that will help us to develop our country more. And another thing I am telling you that Bangladesh foreign policy is very clear. Friendship to all, malice to, towards none. Actually, we take loan and then we repay the bill with interest. So, uh, for our development, we uh, try to avail every, you know, things which will ben be beneficial for our country. You expect that besides the investments. Uh, there will be also some capacity building, uh, uh, transference of knowledge and skills to the labor force. And all the projects we are implementing now, definitely our people are working there. So they are, it is one kind of training they have, they are getting, and actually people are gaining. They can get works and they can uh, get the knowledge. Bangladesh is one of the countries very much affected by climate change, uh, natural disasters, flooding. Uh, what are the projects in that area that you would like to implement? And do you think that Western uh, powers have more responsibility in financing adaptation mitigation measures? They should contribute. Also for other small island country and other countries, those are affected, especially climate vulnerable countries, they need support 
and assistance. And I am always ready to share our experience and I'm, we are doing it. Bangladesh holds more than one million uh, refugees, uh, Rohingya refugees from Myanmar. What is your um, advice and your suggestions for a more, a better global uh, uh, management of refugees and migrants? Unfortunately, after uh, COVID-19 pandemic and also the Ukraine war and sanction, counter sanction, the assistance the we have been receiving to support them, it has been reducing. But I requested you, President Ursula, so, and also the disaster management and other, that you do something so that they can go back. Because I know that living as a refugee, it is not very dignified. I want to return to the topic of the war in the Middle East, but because of unprecedented criticism of the so-called most important diplomat in the world. The Israeli government demanded the resignation of the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, a Portuguese politician serving his second term. At issue are his comments about Israel's clear violations of law, emphasizing that no state is above the law. It is known that there was no love lost between Guterres and powerful leaders like former US President Donald Trump and current Russian leader Vladimir Putin. But the United Nations Secretary General now faces criticism from a state with powerful allies and political influence in the international community. His initial response didn't draw back his words, but this may just be the first episode in a case worthy of a thriller fiction series about international intrigue. That's all from me. Thanks for your attention.